All right. Thank you for joining us today. We are going to discuss uh, barriers that are facing students with disabilities um, or students with autism and tips to overcome them. So my name is Samantha Mallory. I'm the director of the Learning Resource Center at Austin Peay State University. Uh, Jamie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Jamie McCrary, Director of Disability Services here at Austin Peay State University. And Emmanuel? I'm Emmanuel Major. I'm the Director of the Full Spectrum Learning Program here also at Austin Peay State University. I really appreciate both of you uh, joining me today. So. I have a few questions for you, and uh, I want to mention that I found these questions um, on this website by Stephanie Snyder. She interviews a lot of people who are in similar positions in education uh, regarding disabilities and autism. Um, so this is a great website, and I think she has really great questions uh, for us to discuss today. With that being said, I'll go ahead and get started here. So what are some common misconceptions about learning disabilities and education? Um, Jamie, would you like to start? Sure, yeah, and I'll, I'll try to be brief because I think I can talk a long time. I'm um, yeah, Misconception number one is that it's not a real disability. Um, we all have learning barriers, but we all don't know the different levels. Uh, and there are learning different styles of learning disabilities as well. Those are kind of, it's kind of a big subheading, but you can have learning disability in reading or in, in writing, but but more importantly, probably for me as well, is a, a learning disability in, in regards to math as well. So um, I, I don't think that many times our professors or in higher education that we address the different types of learning disabilities as, as, as what, you know, what that really constitutes as well. Um, and, and then, you know, the real struggle is how do you address those, those learning disabilities? Those are kind of, because it is kind of uh, student or individualized specific as well. So it is kind of hard to know wh where that might lie. Um, and then how to assist those students. You know, some, um, just like in life, you know, we see we have a barrier, sometimes we, we want to overcome that barrier, but sometimes we don't, you know, so sometimes we bear our head in the sand about it. But that can both be from the educator side, but, but as well as the student side. Thank you. Um, Emmanuel? Um, yes, I will echo what uh, Jamie said. Um, uh, one of the things, one of the misconceptions about learning disabilities is that uh, people with an LD, as we refer to a learning disability, People think that they also have a low IQ or they're not intelligent. That is a big misconception in, in, uh, for students with LD. Learning disabilities uh, are disorders that, that, are, um, that stem not from diminished cognitive ability. So uh, someone can have an LD and still be quite intelligent. The second uh, misconception that I typically see is that some people believe that uh, it will vanish over time and uh, an LD is something that the person is going to have for the, their entire life. So that's why it's important for them to learn a lot of coping strategies to, 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 to um, become a bit more um, comfortable to, man to, to live with it. And of course another misconception is that learning disability is interchangeable with a lot of other disorders like ADHD, like uh, autism spectrum, and that's a big myth. Uh, it's, they are very different, very, very separate. Um, that doesn't mean that somebody on the autism spectrum cannot have an LD as well, but an LD is not uh, an autism spectrum disorder. So a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, have that misconception. So um, I wanted to bring uh, the light to those three steps. First, it's, it has nothing to do with intelligence. Second, it's something that you will have for for your entire life, and third, it's not uh, 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 it's not interchangeable with ADHD or uh, autism spectrum. Thank you very much. Those are all um, fantastic points. So the next question that we have is: Are there any barriers that the students you work with um, commonly experience once they start college? Things they weren't prepared for, things that their peers didn't seem to be experiencing. 
Uh, Jamie, if you want to go ahead. And sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that one. Yeah, I think that students, where they're not prepared, is they're they're unaware of the amount of work that is required. Um, and oftentimes, students with a disability in the K-12 setting receive modifications. Um, and what I mean by that modification is they're not actually responsible to learn all the essential elements of the course um, that their counterparts in high school are often required to do. Um, but in college, we, we do accommodations, which means we, we provide the reasonable accommodations to help them be on the even playing field as their other counterparts as well. So they still have to learn the same amount of material, the same exact way to do it, um, which is some minor um, accommodations to, to make the playing field even for them. So they're just, when they walk into college, they're not prepared or ready for the amount of work that's required to, to keep them on, on pace. Um, example may be that they're not well, they may not be required to read 20 pages a night um, in high school, they are in college. Um, the amount of like a, a research paper could be accepted. Um, if everybody in high school is required to write a 20 page paper and but they only could write a five or 10 page paper that might be accepted for, for credit while in college that would not. So they're just not um, understanding uh, of the uh, they still have to do all the essential elements of the class um, moving forward. Um, and so if, I hope that answered the question there. Sure, yeah. Manual? So yeah, uh, on the autism spectrum side, uh, we saw some of the struggles that uh, our students have. Uh, they struggle with communication. Uh, the way they communicate at home or with a family is very different from the communication system that we have in higher education. And sometimes the miscommunication style can lead to uh, behavior issues or um, um, we can even have some issues going to the dean of students if it's if, if it's not uh, uh, if we don't take care of it as early as possible because so on the spectrum uh, have a different way of communicating they have to have specific um, uh, uh, they have to have specific de details and what exactly you want them to do you cannot have any Im implied uh, communication style or sarcasm they don't get it so they will struggle with those things so the other thing would definitely be social skills uh, in college, we all gonna have some kind of group project to do. So students on the spectrum, they don't do well with understanding others' perspective, or even uh, some of them have a social anxiety, which prevents them to participate for on, in any group setting period. So those are things that would be some sort of barriers for them. Sensory differences um, is another one. Um, how bright is the light in the classroom? how loud is the ticking clock in the classroom. All of those things can actually um, prevent them from learning as best as they can. Others may struggle with motor skills, uh, fine motor skills, gross motor skills. Uh, of course, uh, learning style as, as well. We encourage all professors to use their universal design for learning because um, uh, a lot of students learn best by trying different style uh, during your, uh, your class. So I think that's, those are some of the barriers that they encounter because unfortunately, sometimes some professors have, uh, they are a lecture type of professor, they just wanna give a lecture. And that particular student on the spectrum doesn't do well with auditory style of learning. So um, those could, could be very uh, uh, difficult for them to learn. The next step, of course, would be coping skills. Uh, some of them uh, use uh, physical coping strategies, which could be uh, rocking, pacing, uh, waving or flapping. Those things can, can be disturbing in a class setting, and which could be basically a barrier. If they cannot use those coping strategies, what can they do instead to still be able to uh, function in a um, uh, higher education setting? Great. Those are great. Um Great information. How would you suggest that a student addresses stigmas that be, may be associated with learning disabilities or with autism on a college campus? And that's a great question. And I think that we, we both Emmanuel and I are on the same page as that we, we encourage uh, self-advocacy. Um, and, and that's, especially in our freshman classes oftentimes 
their writings can, you know, you can utilize uh, journaling, you know, there's some of their papers that they have to write or, or some of the things like that, that they can expound upon how they feel a disability is or anything that, that goes around that. And, and, and some students are, utilize that as a, a great leverage point to have that communication um, with not only their, their teachers, but their colleagues as well in, in, in the classes. Helps them understand better. Um, and just open communication. Um, I, I think it's really good when, when students, especially on autism spectrum sometimes, um, are blunt. And in a good way, That that's often a good thing. They don't beat around the bush, right? Um, and Emmanuel can say, when we say beat around the bush, we don't mean actually literally beating a bush. So we use a lot of those phrases sometimes, but, but with, with all students, it is, it is best, and we really advocate that, that space of doing self-advocacy. Learning about your disability is just as important as sharing about your disability. So maybe oftentimes students are now in the mode of just what is having learning disability mean? What does it mean to have a, a hearing impairment? What does it mean to be utilizing a wheelchair? Um, because in high school, everything was kind of done for them. Um, and so being that self-advocate can go a long way for them in that, in that maturation process as well. Manual? Yes, I do agree with uh, Jimmy. Uh, I, I believe the first step in dealing with any sort of stigma is is education. You know, you need to know uh, the facts because a lot of times stigma just comes from absence of knowledge. We, you know, we stigmatize things that we don't understand. So we encourage our students to know facts about their disability, their aut autism spectrum disorder, uh, because if they can educate themselves, they're going to be more aware of the, some of the characteristics of their disability. They're going to be able to uh, know, uh, think better and reinforce their uh, thinking and, and they're going to be able to also educate others. This is where the advocacy comes from. And when we talk about education of other people, we want to pass on the facts because a lot of time uh, stigma is reinforced by, by a lot of uh, rumors or opinion. But what, to deal with that, we have to work with a lot of facts and use positive attitude. You know, we need to focus on the positive. Uh, we teach our students that autism spectrum has a lot of positive characteristics that they can use to their advantages. Uh, yes, we can spend times just talking about negative, but we also have to focus on the positive because that's what's going to help them support each other. That's the next level. You have to um, understand that you're not alone in whatever disability that you have. And so kind of find who can, you can find some kind of support with them. Uh, you can encourage each other. And then of course, advocate against any sort of discrimination that, that, that you encounter. Those are some of the things we discuss with our students when it comes to dealing with stigma. Uh, they need to educate themselves, focus on the facts, uh, help each other, and of course, um, advocate against any sort of discrimination. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, y'all will probably have good answers for this one. Where can students seek help or advice if an issue does arise? You know, we are we want to be that that partner with the student um, and helping them to understand perception is reality. Um, and so we, we really try to hear both sides of the issues. So we, we want, we encourage them, both of us, I do believe this, Emmanuel agree that we really want to hear their side of the story. We share with them, if they see a problem arise, we're going to also reach out to, let's just, for example, say there's a problem with an instructor. Um, and so we'll, we'll share, okay, we're going to you know, reach out to the instructor. I want to hear what they say as well. Um, and so oftentimes we're kind of the mediator. Uh, between the two uh, individuals and, and so oftentimes there's a learning curve with both um, and so what is what is the objective what do we need to get done and, and so oftentimes Emmanuel and I are going to have to be creators and creative to find that 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 happy medium where we all we all are we're all benefiting something out of it so um and it, then I share with them, there's always, you know, multiple sides. There's always two sides to every school. So maybe they misunderstood something or maybe a misunderstanding on the professor side, for example. 
Uh, so we, we often tell them, come talk to us. We're, we're always available for you to come uh, share where, where you might feel like you're being misunderstood or where there's a problem so we can assist. Daniel? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I think Jimmy says it all. Uh, we are um, a source of, of support for our students. We want them to communicate. That's the, the key word here. Whenever there's an issue that arises, we ask them to be able to communicate that with us. Uh, Jimmy and I, we typically say, hey, we haven't figured out how, how to read people's mind yet so we need you to tell us what you need you know so this is the, the key word here uh whenever there's an issue uh they need to be able to communicate that with with either the, the full spectrum learning office or the office of disability services or even the learning resource center anyone that is in in a position to help they, they can they can ask for help but that's that's the step that's typically the most difficult for them is to get out of their comfort zone and ask for help because help will come. Uh, we are here to support any students. Um, we may not, the, the other thing I like to tell my students, we may not be the person who knows the answer, but we may know who knows the answer. So just by asking us, you've done the right thing because we're gonna help navigate and find out exactly how to, to get the right, the next steps. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so this one's about, you know, what students can do for themselves. What are ways students can start to build a long distance support system if they attend, attend college away from their friends or family? Yes, yeah, one more time. I'm not hearing that question. That's okay. What can students who are not near friends or family, um, so if they're, you know, attending college in a different city or a different state, what can they do to build a support system? while they're at college. Big believer in um, reaching out, um, you know, getting involved outside of the academic world is, is super important. Um, I mean, we are in college for a reason to, to gain an education, yes. But we, we advocate that not every bit of learning happens in the classroom. There's a lot of extra learning that happens outside the classroom. So get involved in, a club or organization, um, religious affiliation, whatever it may be, you know, a Pokemon club or whatever it is, or athletic club, something um, that you find interesting. I dare say there's not a club for everything on, on a college campus. Um, and, and that can help build that, that social support system in a brick by brick. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, I. I can say that when I went off to college, I, I literally went off um, to a community college in, in Florida and I knew no one whatsoever. And I thought, did I make a mistake? And I'm glad that I didn't, you know, go straight home, you know? So I, I built brick by brick by brick. It took a little time, but the patience is a, is a, is a virtue, which sometimes I don't own. Uh, and, and obviously for college students as well, it's tough to be patient, but building those, those connections outside the classroom can be so much beneficial as well. Um, and we want to address too, I'm a big advocate in, in reaching out to the counseling services that most college campuses has. Um, if you're really struggling from a mental health standard or standpoint, that can also be of a huge help as well to help you make those connection points as well. But it's also, and lastly, stay, stay somewhat in context or contact with your high school friends. Um, I mean, I still have, you know, not that we talk every day, or not even once a month, but I talked to um, one of my friends from high school that we, it's like, you've got a family, I've got a family, you know, but we talk maybe every six months, but I know without a shadow of a doubt, he's going to be there if I need him, if he knows that as well. So have those connection points, you know, near and far, and probably going to be Emmanuel? Yeah, I believe that Jamie already covered it all. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what, that's what I was going to say. Uh, you don't want to uh, uh, leave all of your support behind. So even if you transition to becoming, to being at a different uh, location, you can still maintain the same support system that you had in high school or back home. So that's why one of the first step is to build a support system now. That way you don't have to start from scratch when you come to college. That's the, that's the most, that's the advice that we give students. 
um, and also of course to, to be involved. Uh, when you are on a college campus, you, you, feel, you feel like you belong the more involved you are. Otherwise, if you sit in your room the whole time, then you don't feel like you're part of the university, part of the system. So that the feeling of the the idea of feeling like you belong also is a great support is, is a great way to to feel supported and have a support system. And of course, uh, Austin P uh, is a, a medium sized university where we we have a lot of uh, staff and faculty who are there to also support. Um, you can talk to your advisors if you need anything. That's why we talk to the, tell the students. Um, talk to uh, any faculty that will listen. In the full spectrum learning program, we have faculty mentors that help them not only with the transition aspect to from college, but also from college to the workforce as well, which is another aspect that most uh, college students don't think about. Uh, I like to say that college is just a destination. Sorry, it's a transition. College is a transition, not a destination. So as a result, you have to have a support system that is also fluid that can help you through college and to the next level. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so our last question is uh, more on the college side of things. So many colleges have systems in place within their institutions that are not necessarily created with students who have learning disabilities in mind. How can students and faculty and administrators work to create more supportive spaces and systems for these students? That is like the one gazillion dollar question, right? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that I would love to start, um, but just due to the uh, how policies procedures work at, at our university, and they're pretty much aligned in, in most other universities as well, is that I would love to see a disability group set up. Um, I was president of the one when I was at, at, at Florida State. Um, but the same struggles we had there is the same struggle that most universities face. Is just students do not want to identify, self-identify with that. So that, that is a huge struggle. Um, but I believe it can be a big benefit in the, in the structures there to do it. Um, we just need to have students who are willing and, and, and wanting that desire to be uh, forward facing in that. Uh, we, we got a lot, a lot of great ideas and, and we're really working towards that. Um, we're really in this past year, we are kind of incentivizing students to have more direct conversation with their instructors about their accommodations. Um, and we've seen some benefit there as well. So it's a slow and steady pace, but I, I think we, we want to see um, administrators, uh, and I believe we do, uh, we, do, we do set a lot of um, you know, financial funds set aside because there are unfortunately things that do cost money. Um, but both Emmanuel and I both have fantastic supervisors and, and chairs of departments that really desire both programs to be successful. Um, um, I don't know if Emmanuel will ever tell you this, but the full spectrum learning, there's only three in the Southeastern United States. And that's huge that Austin Peay State University has one. Um, we have students who come from us or to us from not just the, from the Clarksville area, um, not just from the state of Tennessee, but from Virginia and Maryland and, and Alabama and, and, and other states that are yearning to help their students be successful. Um, and I know without a shadow of a doubt that without Emmanuel's program, um, not that they couldn't be successful, but it surely aids in the process. I think same thing can be said with disability services. What we provide is not ensuring that they will definitely be successful, but it gives them the tools necessary. Um, and so um, through assessment and evaluation, we, we see this and we've, we've fairly grown uh, to promote forward-facing services that absolutely Assess our and Emmanuel. Yes, um, similar things to what Jimmy just said. I, um, one of the things we encourage is uh, for students to participate in um, promoting some of their um, promoting what they would like to see in the universities. And one of the things we, they do is to have student uh, organizations. 
uh, Jimmy said there was not currently one for specifically for disability services, but we just have one now, which is called Advocate for Autism, which is a student-led organization that is going towards those ideas of uh, empowering other students, even if they are not uh, openly um, uh, identified as autistic. If they just want to participate in the in the organization, they're gonna be able to to remove some of the stigmas that, that we have uh, towards the autism spectrum community. Uh, the other thing that Jimmy and I do a lot is uh, training. We try to, to, to talk to faculty and staff as often as we possibly can. We, we extend our invitation to all um, deans, to all chairs of departments, whenever they need us. We will be there to, to educate the faculty and staff on how to work with students with disability, work with students with autism spectrum because um, we want to make sure that they are also they also have the, the tool necessary to, to do their job that, that, to the best of their ability as well. So uh, with all that in, in, in mind, that's, uh, we, we hope that's going to be able to, to help create a space and a system where the students can strive and be successful. I have one more to that as well, and thank you for being able to remind me of that too, is that you know, with the training we do, uh, facilitate those trainings and uh, you know, knowledge is power um, not only for the students but for the, for the instructors as well and that there are legal laws that we're mandated to, to go by um, and, and, and sometimes Emmanuel and I sit in this world all day long and that we know this um, every day um, but I fail to remember sometimes that sometimes our instructors are not as you know some of those legal laws that do mandate some things so I have to kind of approach it uh, from a, a, a different level sometimes. And so, um, the, they and I are great partners in providing those training. It's a great advocate for us as well. Absolutely. Um, well, again, thank you all so very much for um, for answering these questions today. I think it's um, a really important topic to discuss, and I hope that we can continue um, to talk about it and to bring awareness to the to the topic. And I look forward to, to speaking with you all more in the future. We're here to help. If you need another Zoom meeting, we're glad to meet anytime. Awesome. Thank you so much. Anytime. All right. No Emmanuel, behave. No. <laughs> <laughs>